Coming up on Theater Talk. You're directing um, two of uh, our, our, the world's greatest actors. How, how do you handle these guys? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you whip um, them into shape? Sometimes <laughs> very delicate. <laughs> sometimes very stern. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, I have seen two marvelous plays on Broadway last week. Two contemporary classics, Harold Pinter's No Man's Land, one of my favorite, favorite of the uh, contemporary works, and uh, the absolute classic Samuel Beckett, Waiting for Godot, in terrific productions, directed by fine, fine director Sean Mathias. Welcome back to... Have you been on this show before, Sean? No, I I've never been on this show, no. First oh, time. Debut at Theatre Talk. Theatre Talk Virgin. Uh, and he's got these uh, minor character actors you may have heard of in this play that he's overseen. Uh, Patrick Stewart, welcome back to Theatre Talk. You were Thank so you, brilliant man. in Macbeth a few years ago. Thank you. And Ian McKellen, who we've not seen, I haven't seen, I think, since uh, Dance of Death that Sean did several years ago with mm, Yes, 2001. That's yeah. right. Well, gentlemen, welcome to Theatre Talk. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, Sean, why this pairing? Why No Man's Land and why Waiting for Godot? Is, is there a link in your mind somewhere um, that we should be aware of? It's a, a, a tremendous amount of serendipity in a way because both plays I tried to do over a number of years and failed for whatever reasons. They'd never come together. Mm. And after 20 years of trying to do Godot, we finally did it, uh, Ian and Patrick and I did it in London. We did it on a, a wonderful tour of the UK and then brought it into London. Patrick uh, left it and subsequently we went on to do it. Ian uh, did it with Roger Rees and we did it yeah. again in London and we did it in Australia. You traveled the world with it. We went to South Africa, we played in a township. We played in a township without the set in Kailitsha in South Africa, which was an incredible night. Playing to 10 year old children from a township with Godot was a fantastic experience. Mm. Anyway, Patrick then asked me to do uh, No Man's Land with him, and I said, well, that's a play I wanted to do for about 20 years, and I've tried to do that twice before and failed. And he wanted to do it with Ian, but I had asked Ian to do it, and Ian was a little unsure about it. He wasn't convinced by the play. So we did a reading of it, the three of us, with a couple of other actors, and um, I think we were all fairly seduced into it. And <laughs> oddly and quite simply, my partner had said to me, you know, if... If Patrick's very keen to do No Man's Land, but Ian's quite keen to do Godot again, because we hadn't done it in America, why don't they both give in to one another and do both the plays? And I said, well... And, and here you are. Well, you know, <laughs> that just sounds like a piece of opportunism, but it was opportunism that had made so much sense yeah. because of the connections between Beckett and Pinter and the way you can cross-cast the plays. Absolutely. And then we all decided, well, that's a... that You know, these chaps, uh, they don't like to sort of... Uh, let the grass grow. So uh, a challenge like that, a thrilling uh, I, a possibility of doing repertoire, seemed too good to be true, and that, and so we're here. Let me ask you guys: um, When you approach No Man's Land, can I? Let me ask you, Patrick: Why were you so enthusiastic about this play, and what were your reservations about it? Ian, I experienced the play for the first time in the theatre in performance with John Gilgood and Ralph Ritchie. One of the legendary evenings in the theatre. Yes. And I went back twice more that week and would have gone a fourth time if I could have afforded it. <laughs> and at one of those occasions, I said to myself, one day, one day, I will be in this play. I didn't even at that time think what I might play. Mm. Probably not one of the two leading roles. No, you were a bit young when you were watching. Play the thuggish <laughs> guy who comes in. Yeah, and I, yeah. Out. There was a time I was a natural Briggs. Not <laughs> maybe as natural as the great Shula Helms, Hensley is, <laughs> but nevertheless. Um, and it's been there on my to-do list for uh, 35 years. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to share a dressing room with my friend here for 22 weeks, mm -hmm. increasingly I saw not only... In, as I got to know him better and better, but also on stage, that here indeed was the, the made-to-measure spooner for No Man's Land. Mm -hmm. And then, so I simply fell into the other role, naturally. Mm -hmm. 
And Ian, you had, but you had some reservations about the place? Well, I've, I've never had a wish list, but I, uh, if I had a non-wish list, I think No Man's Land would have been on it. <laughs> uh, as, as, a, as a wonderfully entertaining play, and, and like Patrick, I, I, I saw the original production, but was so impressed by, by particularly Gielgud's performance that constantly in rehearsals I've been saying to Sean, is that Gielgud that I've just done? I, I, I seem to be able to remember exactly his intonation for so much of the part. I thought, well, if the part's been played perfectly, why, why do I have to come and trample over the territory? <laughs> and I, I thought of the original production, it, it was an event about acting. Mm. Perhaps people might think this uh, about this production of ours, I don't know. But that was the central thing. You were going to see the great at nights. Uh, and Pinto came in as a, um, uh, an added bonus. <laughs> but I'm, am I so pleased that we had that reading, which, uh, which we laughed. That, that was the turning point for me. The, oh, you found Uncontrollable humor. laughter. <coughs> Unable to speak the next line because it was so funny that I thought, well, I, 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 well, I deny myself that pleasure. Were Richardson and Gielgud funny in the original production, or was it that yes. sense of menace that sometimes... They were very, they were very, very eccentric, uh, as they were as people. Hmm. Do you know, they had turned down, uh, for Peter Hall, who directed it, the, the first English production of Waiting for Goddard. Hmm. Both of them. And I think re regretted that mistake <laughs> so much <laughs> that when he came about 20 years later and said, well, here's another interesting play you might like to do together, they both said, yes, 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 <laughs> immediately, uh, <laughs> which is a link between what we're doing. You said that uh, No Man's Land w raised more questions for the audience than they were prepared to answer, and that this was one of your reservations about it. Has Patrick helped you to answer Has he some answered of all the, those questions yes, for you? Have, you? have you shared an interpretation where you can... I, 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 th I think the play is crystal clear. Uh, I have no problems with understanding the plot, as it were, the story, um, which we needn't go into. But uh, it, perhaps that's a, a virtue of this production, that it's, it is perfectly clear, I think, what's going on, that two men ha have a drink in a pub, uh, in uh, northern London and um, um, become friends as, as one of them takes the other one home and uh, I begin to see what's going on in this menage a trois that, that, that he uh, disastrously lives in and I try and uh, rescue him from it at the same time as inveigle my way into it. <laughs> that seems to me what's going on. But the effect on the audience uh, uh, and, and on us in rehearsal is something much more mysterious than that. And, it comes out of the elegance of the language and, the, and, and Pinter's wit. Uh, a lot of this play, I think, may have been written when he was um, Oh, really? Drunk. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, I don't It's so convincing, the, the, the drunken um, mind meanderings. Of, of that would make drunk. a no, lot I, of Yeah, no, the alcoholism is, uh, is a fu fuels so much of, 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 of these characters. And Pinter was a, a, a big drinker back Enjoyed in the day. Drink. I also had a slight worry that, that perhaps for America it, it might be too English a play. You couldn't say that of Waiting for Godot, which is absolutely yeah. universal, but was this too much about English class and the references to cricket and so on? Hilariously funny for, for, for Brits. Would they be picked up and relished by a, a Broadway audience? But English well, class? I was, I was a fool because Broadway Is that working? Are they laughing yeah. at the cricket any? references? Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, Yes, they, they understand that it's humorous, and this is largely the way this dialogue is being handled by Ian, um, without perhaps knowing the exact detail of it. But that's the brilliance of this writing in both plays, that often it's simply about rhythm of language, which can trigger a reaction from the audience. Give us a sense now, Sean, you're directing um, two of, two of uh, our, our, the world's greatest actors. How, how do you handle these guys? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you whip them um, into shape? Sometimes <laughs> very delicately, <laughs> sometimes very sternly. <laughs> well, we're all quite close now. You know, it's great, um, the fact that we did Godot together. You get to know one another and uh, there's an intimacy between us. And it's like uh, in any situation when you're very close, you have to sort of suss out what the mood is and when you can push a little harder to get a little more. I mean, we concentrate on the plays, you know. I, all I want them to be is the very, 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 very best they can be in these plays. And they're both completely wonderful actors and uh, mining the text with them and their, uh, their absolute uh, interest in not stopping, in going further, looking for more and getting more makes my job that much easier. If they were like resistant and said, well, that's enough and I won't take any more notes, so, well, 
be end of story, but I don't think uh, I'd be with them if they were like that. They're, they're both absolutely hungry to be better. It's thrilling. So you've talked about the rhythm, and I, I was so impressed in both plays with how you play off of each other's rhythm so beautifully. Que voulez-vous? Que voulez-vous? Ah, que voulez-vous? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How much do you work on that, and how do you work on well, there's that? A, there's, a, there's a lot about the characters that suggested to the three of us that um, Dee Dee and Gogo, in a former life, because uh, the past uh, is often referenced in the play, and they've known each other for 50 years, mm -hmm. uh, they're not lovers, uh, but they're, they are colleagues and, and, and friends, and so familiar with each other. We thought the possibility that they'd worked together in a, in a very close relationship uh, was perhaps the case and and um, as we're theatre people we thought perhaps they had, they too had been theatre people and they had been a, um, a a double act couple on stage like Laurel and Hardy and, and, and many others and this is not a new uh, idea with, with the play. And well we know that Beckett loved yeah. the great silent right. film yeah. and s insisted they wear bowler hats which is reference back to the acts like that but the point about about stand-up comics is that they're, they are absolute it's a, it's a marriage of words they, they know exactly their own rhythms uh, and they can jazz together, and that's what these two characters do, uh, sometimes intentionally and sometimes because they simply can't help it. I think the, the uh, um, uh, balance that you're talking about is probably to do with the fact that uh, you've got two absolutely wonderful actors who've worked together so, so finely and so closely. I mean, when I read the play many, many, many years ago, I couldn't discern the differences on the page between the two characters. It's a very hard play to fathom when you first read it, especially <laughs> to a younger mind. Mm. And it probably would have been disastrous if I had directed it when I first wanted to, when I was barely 30. I think, you know, it, it's with time that, uh, that um, <coughs> as my own life has grown and I've aged, as it were, that um, you know, I've, I've learned how to be able to direct it. I think there's another thing, if I may, no, please, yeah. um, about the rhythm of both these plays because they, they have music in the language. Um, I think that's helped by our backgrounds, which are shared and are common, and that is many years of working with blank verse, um, where again uh, uh, an instinct for the rhythm and a feeling for it is absolutely essential. A few days ago, I, someone sent me a little video of Ian analyzing Macbeth's great Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow speech. And, and several decades ago, this was filmed, <laughs> and it, it, Ian talks about the character, but also talks about the essential rhythmic nature of that speech and how it informs the emotion and the mood. Well, we both come from that same tradition, and I think that's helped us a lot mm. in some of those sections of both plays where rhythm is almost everything. Since these plays are so tightly constructed and the rhythm is important, do you ever find yourself sort of off the rhythm, off the beat, if you will, at some point? And when you find yourself there, how, how do you get, how do you get back, back on the right tempo? Well, fortunately, there are two of us, and we're not monologists. We are, we are a duo, and, and so I, I, I think we've been at it so, so, so long to, to, as a partnership now on stage that uh, we don't really fall out of rhythm, and, uh, and we, we, we cling on to each other. <laughs> you were laughing, though. Have you? Seen well, I was laughing because not only have they got a, the rhythms of Beckett are so complex and yeah. extraordinary, and they've got to crack that. They then got to go and hang up their Beckett frocks, turn around, put on their pinto frocks, get on stage, and do his rhythms. So it's quite a challenge, you know, to that. Well, Patrick, we, before we started taping, you said that uh, it's hard when you you stop the one play and then go to the next to get rid of the residue of the mm -hmm. of the first play. I feel elements of the character and certainly of the language mm. infiltrating into the second play of the day and I found it helpful. I found it elevating. Mm. It, it lifts and energizes me feeling that in but beyond that I, I don't know how to analyze it more. And for me it's like uh, suddenly uh, being in a, in, in a magic house where you're, you're in one sort of room and then you walk through a door and you're in another one and uh, I, I don't know. It's it's a wonder. It's a wonderfully um, exciting and not unsettling experience. And they're both about death and dementia, we may say, and futility. But I want to ask you this: Do you find any optimism in them? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I'm asking them. Yeah. <laughs>
No, but no, I see it. Yes, we yes. do. Yes, but tell, tell, because I people know these plays as being sort of downplayed, but I want you to speak to our viewers about what's so up and optimistic about them besides the fact that you are there. In, For in many life. people in life, getting through the day, getting through the afternoon, or the next hour, or the next minute, is a challenge. All of us have experienced this at some time or other. And I find in both these plays that at the end, these guys are going on. We have not come, no, we <coughs> talk about suicide. We talk about hanging ourselves and waiting for God oh twice, but they never do. They are going on and the, 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 the urge to hold on to hang in is so powerful a presence in both these plays for me. I also think these plays are about um, about friendship, oh, which yeah. has its optimistic nature too. That yeah. as bleak as it may be, if you're two people who love each other, and they do in, in both of these plays in their way, um, that connection is is life. Mm -hmm. Dependability, yes. Yeah. So many plays are, are about basically one character, mm. King Lear. Wonderful parts around him, but no, King Lear, the, everything depends on that. And that's one of the reasons that uh, we don't get to work together very often, because there aren't many plays that are about two mm. characters mm. Uh, of equal uh, status. And uh, these are two examples of plays which absolutely depend on, on, on the, uh, the, uh, the dependability of the, of, of, the, um, of, the, of the two characters getting on. And in... Uh, in, in the, the Beckett particularly, an, another double act, as it were, another duo, uh, Pozzo and Lucky, who arrive out of nowhere and take over the stage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we, we have to make way for them and then decide, are we going to join in? Are we going to become a quartet? Go-Go thinks, I think perhaps I might become a trio and leave, leave Didi alone, <laughs> but then, then he gets drawn back. <coughs> and so relationships, relationships in, in both plays, crucial. And, and you can't get through life without other people, I think could easily be the message of both plays. No, I, th I think that's true. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask you all, since it is the 50th anniversary of the great National Theatre, and have you had a, you've had a connection to the National, have you? Or? Indeed, Judy Dench sang Send in of the Clowns course, from right, my production of Little Night Music on the, at the uh, car. I just wanted to get a sense from each of you when you f what it was like when you first went to work for the National Theatre as an actor or as a director. Um, who was there, what it was like to walk into this great building and know in some ways you've, you've well, arrived. Well, I should start because I think I got there first. Yeah. I, I, I worked at the National Theatre when it was at the old Vic Theatre right. yeah. before they had the, the custom-built uh, premises on the South Bank. Were you uh, under Olivier? Was uh, he? And he, he was my employer. Uh, I, I didn't work, alas, with him. I, I worked for him. Mm -hmm. But uh, with Maggie Smith and her then husband, uh, Robert Stevens, and uh, Joan Plowright, Lady Olivier, and uh, many, many other actors, uh, practically every actor, um, with the exception of Patrick, uh, of, of my generation, uh, went through the, that company for Olivier. I mean, Anthony Hopkins, Derek Jacoby, Mike Gambon were all there. Uh, and it just felt to be the center of our world, and, and was in a sense. I'm reading uh, Michael Blakemore's wonderful book, uh, Stage Blood. I don't know if you've come across it, but there was a sense of a lot of intrigue always at this theater. You know, Olivier's deposed by Peter Hall. Were, were you ever aware of that stuff going you, on? You can forget that, because that, that, that happens in any organization, of <laughs> course. That, that there's a hierarchy which is challenged. But, you know, for, for the audiences, and, and that's why theaters exist, uh, there, there was such richness. And one of the riches wa was um, the first production of uh, No Man's Land, which, which happened there. And then things changed and other directors came in and, and, and you worked for them. And when did you, when did you arrive at the, the National? <coughs> uh, 80s, was it? Uh, yes, in 1985. I, I've only worked at the National once. Oh, you were uh, an RRC guy, right? Was that I, your... I was, largely, yes. Peter Hall employed me at the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1966, and the following year he resigned. Right, right. Peter Hall employed me at the National Theatre in 1985, and the following year resigned. <laughs> so I, I lost my hook in both theatres, so I, I hung on in the RSC. Um, I, I love going to the National Theatre. It is the most exciting place in London for live theatre. Mm -hmm. And I hope that um, we now have a new artistic director about to take Ru over. Rufus Norris, yeah. Uh, and I, yes, mm -hmm. fine director. I hope that I'll be 
adding to my presently rather modest total of one appearance. Yeah. And who and who was running it when you walked in? Richard you? Eyre. I mean, oh, yeah. two of the biggest influences of my career being Richard Eyre and Jerry Schoenfeld. And yeah. <laughs> we took um, a revival of, of a play that Ian debuted, Bent. Oh, yeah. We wonderful. took the, the, uh, the, revi the, the first um, revi a revival of it ever. We did it for uh, Stonewall. We did it as a fundraiser to uh, one night only, uh, one night only yeah. to raise money for Stonewall, which was the um, you know gay uh, awareness mm -hmm. activist group. I won't go into the history of Section 28 or a number of things that had happened in England. And from that one night only, we got we were invited to the National. But then I went on to do, I did Vanya with Ian and Tony Cher and Janet McTeer. Oh, I saw that. Uh, mm -hmm. Les Parents Terribles, which Jerry brought of course, to of course. Broadway as indiscretion. With Eileen and Eileen Atkins. Eileen and uh, Kathleen Turner, Jude Law, the first thing Jude did, Cynthia Nixon. And, but I also did Little Night Music there, which uh, was so successful, it, it uh, ran in the end in the repertoire for over a year and broke at that time all the box office records of the National Theatre. And so uh, Richard Eyre was a wonderful impression. I read uh, Richard, I, I love the diaries that you British theatre people keep because they, <laughs> they settle scores and they reveal all things. And I, I, as I asked you about the intrigue around Olivia, I remember reading Richard Eyre's, di Richard Eyre's diaries and he talks about battling Great Depression at the same time he's running this major institution. Yes. Are these things that you were aware of? That, or well, you were aware because Richard was quite a... Uh, Maybe Moody's too strong a word, but a sort of private person, and and the the rumor always was that if he got bad reviews, he was absolutely so he depressed. Couldn't come into work. Couldn't come into oh, really? work. Uh -huh. But as an impresario to work for as a producer, he was the absolute best, the tip top. He'd come to the run throughs, give you such positive notes, and then all through previews would guide you. I mean, for a young directors myself, Declan Donlan was there, yeah, Sam yeah, yeah. Mendes was there, Deborah Warner was there, Stephen Daldry was there. Yeah. It was an absolutely thrilling time. When we did Vanya in the Cottesloe, the other play in the repertoire was Angel De Declan Donnellan's Angels in America, right, his right. production of Angels in America. That theatre at that time between Vanya and Angels in America was the hotspot of London. So it was a thrilling time because all one's, one's own talent was growing and being uh, encouraged and it was you know very exciting for you, but everyone around you was so talented. And you can't say it too often in this country, with deep respect, because there's no uh, more exciting for an actor to play than in, on Broadway. Uh, yeah, I, um, re I really mean that. Many English actors have told us that. really that, mean that. that sound however, you hear from a Broadway. However, if you're, if you're going to try and earn a living and live at home uh, and you're British and National Theatre's where you want to be and really uh, America could afford a national theatre couldn't they? It, it, it wouldn't necessarily be what we've got and probably it would right. be a touring theatre but the idea of, of public money going to provide a resource for visitors to the to, to the country well, uh, well, you, the natives you, is a, a very appealing one. Sorry to interrupt you have to leave now or we could get into a whole thing about the politics of America and how they can't even afford <laughs> but, to but, give but, their but, children but, lunches. Invite us back and we yes. will get back. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that I do think the National Theater actually has become a very important part of our landscape here in America yes. because so many great productions are coming from there and, and coming here. That the two, the, this, you know, the, the divide between uh, America and, and or New York and London is almost gone as far as I'm concerned. As if if as I may make know. a point that's been made by Sean very effectively, um, what we are doing now on commercial Broadway mm -hmm. is a little microcosm of what the National Theatre yep, yep. would do. Where would you go to see Harold Pinter and Beckett in repertory with the same company of actors. On the You'd, same day. On the, on the same, same day. day. You'd yeah, almost sure. certainly have to get on a plane and fly to the National Theatre in London, to the South Bank. Well, we brought that same world on into commercial Broadway. And I think we feel not smug, but a little pleased with us. Bravo, and, yes, and, bravo. And, and because we've all, we felt this right from the word go when, 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 when uh, Sean initiated everything that we, we didn't want to be a British company arriving. We, want, we wanted to be working with locals. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's an American production, because No Man's Land originated here. We did do Godot in England, yes, but not with these two new American actors. And Ian and Patrick were very, very keen that the other actors would be American. Mm. Have we mentioned and Billy Cruder? You have not. We have not. Oh, well, we should Shuler have. Hensley. A sensational lucky. And, uh, and Shuler, to be on stage with Shuler is uh, like being on stage with a tornado. And it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shuler, Shuler, I believe, also is a product of the National Theatre, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes. He was in Oklahoma That's with I Hugh saw. Jackman. So, oh, so. Oh, oh, brought, it brought him to a Tony Award via the <laughs> National Theatre. <laughs> but it really you. is a quartet. I mean, yeah. I know... Oh, yes. We are an ensemble. 
It's an absolute quote. It's a true ensemble. Well, don't miss it. Um, in repertory at the Court Theatre, No Man's Land, great Harold Pinter play, and Waiting for Godot, Samuel Beckett. I would imagine that the best way to experience them is to do them in one day. That way you have the immersive experience. That's what I would do as an audience, mm. yeah. yeah. And you can get very cheap uh, tickets, day tickets, for any performance. $30, you can sit on the front row of these plays. Wonderful. Patrick Stewart. Sir Patrick Stewart. Sir, pa Sir, Sir Ian McKellen. McKellen. Yes. And played old Sean. Played not so old. <laughs> Thanks a lot for being here. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Say you are, even if it's not true. Oh, oh, what am I to say? Say, I am happy. I am happy. <laughs> so am I. So am I. We are yeah. happy. We are happy. What do we do now, now that we're happy? <laughs> we wait for God oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Donnelly Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.